I'm Scott Lucas. This is World Unfiltered. Today, we want to discuss Turkey's perception of the changes that we're seeing in international relations amongst multiple issues from the Middle East to Turkish relations with Europe to the shifting positions of the US and Russia. We appear to be a key moment. The new Biden administration, Russian foreign policy, which has renegotiated relations with Turkey, and of course, multiple issues across the Middle East and North Africa. So to try to get a handle on this, I wanted to turn today to Professor Soli Ozel. Uh, he's a senior lecturer at Istanbul Qadar Hash University. He has also been involved at the uh, Shell Center for Human Rights at Late Law, uh, Yale Law School, a visiting lecturer in the political science department of Yale, and he is now currently associated with Paris's Institute Montaigne. Professor Ozel, welcome very much to World Unfiltered. Thank you for helping me and the viewers today. Very happy to be here, Professor Lucas. I wanted to start today, if I could, in getting almost in a sense your personal reading and also perhaps as an analyst, your perception on what the Turkish government's approach will be right now to the new Biden administration as it takes shape in Washington. Although we have a number of officials who were involved in the Obama administration with whom Turkish authorities would have worked, uh, such as Anthony Blinken, the new Secretary of State. It's a very different world from four years ago, arguably. So where's our starting point for this? Our starting point, let me start with the simpler one. Uh, then I'll get to the more complicated one of how uh, Turkey's rulers view the world we're living in and how they believe Turkey's interests would be better served, as far as I can understand. They were not terribly happy <laughs> that uh, Joe Biden won the presidency. President Erdogan has established a very close and almost intimate relation with President Trump. And uh, because President Trump was not an institutionally minded person, that personal relation actually enabled Turkey to, act, to do a lot of things that it wanted to do, which probably the American security establishment did not approve of, which President Trump did not mind implementing or basically being very receptive to Turkey's demands and Turkey's explanations of why relations were it seemingly were on the rocks. But <clears throat> at any rate, you have to play with the hand that you dealt. Therefore, they've been trying since the day of the elections to get on the better side of the Biden administration to establish a rapport, to establish links. And so far, although they say there's been numerous talks, the Biden side did not necessarily conform, confirm that there'd been conversations. You're absolutely right that the number of people who are going to be serving in the Biden administration know Turkey intimately well. The person from the State Department under the Obama administration who dealt with Turkey, Amanda uh, is, uh, is now in the Security Council in charge of other things as well as Turkey. Anthony Blinken intimately knows Turkey. The uh, National Security Advisor to the Vice President, Kam Kamala Harris, Philip Gordon is also someone who worked very long years on Turkish files, Turkey files as well. So it, the, the problem is not going to be getting to know one another, <laughs> but the problem is going to be to start talking the same, speaking in the same language again. Uh, many of those people have expressed disappointments with Turkey in the past. Uh, relations with the Obama administration at the end of that administration were not really at their best. The Obama people had their own reasons to be cross with Turkey, and Turkey had a very big reason, at, le at the very least one big reason, to be very cross with the Obama administration. And I'll mention it because I think it shapes the way they look at the world, and that was the very insufficient response or reaction reflex of the US administration on the night of 15th of July, 2016, when there was a coup attempt in Turkey. And I, by the way, I share the view of the Turkish government that the response of Turkey's allies at the time this was unfolding, whatever they may have found out about it and the true story later on was left a lot to be desired. And uh, I'll try to hold my tongue, but I think it was abominable. <laughs> anyway, and so that actually informs the two sides' approach to one another. And in the past four years, many American pundits believed that Turkey was no longer really an ally. A lot of people talked about expelling Turkey from NATO, although that cannot really be done. And I found, I personally find that kind of talk 
rather infantile, uh, but that there are problems in terms of both communication, but most importantly, in terms of hardcore interests that are no longer identical between the Turkish and the American administrations. That's a given, and I don't know how this is going to be resolved. The Turkish government looks around and basically sees, I think, two or three attributes for the period to come. One, the United States made a total mess of its Iraq war. Therefore, it made a total mess of the Middle East. It did not keep its promises of promotion of democracy when it came to the results of the Arab Spring. There, there is room for debate as to what had happened in Egypt, in my view, and is in general unhappy with the way Obama administration actually extract, extricated itself from the mess of the Middle East. Secondly, they also see as a result of the failures of the United States in uh, Iraq and therefore in overall in the Middle East, they see the United States as a power in decline, which will no longer be able to shape the fate of the Middle East. And that because there is now a vacuum being created or a vacuum has been created in the region and the Syria policy was full of incoherent moves, Turkey believes that you grab what you must, otherwise you cannot really protect your interests. And as a geopolitically rather preciously located Turkey cannot really afford to let vacuums simmer in, in its vicinity and therefore it would be an active actor to protect its own interests. As a result, and on the, in the wake of the very great disappointment that on the 15th of July, the allies were actually missing, the president went to President Putin and probably made a number of deals. And as a result of those deals, the most prominent result of which was the purchase of S-400 missiles from Russia, he also got, in return for giving up Aleppo, he also got the Russian green light to intervene by now three times in Syria. And therefore, as a result, Turkey now holds three different spaces in Syria. It has changed the demography of the province of Afrin. It now operates administrative offices, schools in part of Syria. It has managed with the consent of both the Russians and most importantly of President Trump, it has managed to divide up territorially the, the uh, space in the northeast of Syria that was occupied, that was governed by PYD, YPG, which Turkey sees as an, as, as an ex which is an extension of the PKK and Turkey therefore sees as a nemesis. And it now has over 10,000 troops, maybe 15,000 troops in the province of Idlib uh, to protect itself against another inflow of uh, refugees, but also to have an active presence and support mostly jihadist or Islamist uh, organizations that Turkey has been helping almost since the beginning of the Syria conflict. And all of that was, could be done because Turkey managed to have, to find common interests with Russia, with which it, it shares no common interest in terms of what the ultimate result ought to be in Syria, what the ultimate result ought to be in Libya, what the probably what should have happened in the Caucasus. So it's an interesting dance that the two capitals or the two countries that have opposing interests from in the Caucasus, in Syria, in the in Eastern Mediterranean, or in Libya, actually managed not to step on one another's toes. In my judgment, Turkey was on a number of occasions the subordinate partner in this relation. As we've seen when the Russians, the Russians did kill 34 Turkish soldiers last February, and our president visited the Kremlin in, in the wake of that, they couldn't say, or the, Mr. President Erdogan didn't say a word to President Putin about that rather inimical act. So in um, short, therefore, Turkey believes the United States is on its way out. 
Turkey cannot afford the vacuum that the US is leaving behind to be filled by forces that are inimical to its interests. And to that end, he, it is ready to cooperate with the Russians when the two sides' interests coincide. And then if the uh, Russians and Turks have different interests, they also compete uh, in their own grounds and on their own terms. That's, that's a fantastic survey. Let me, let me step back just to go to the past before we come back to the present. In summer of 2016, was it a question from President Erdogan's standpoint of actually getting the extradition of the cleric Fethullah Gulen, whom he blamed for the coup attempt and who was in Pennsylvania, or would it have sufficed on the night of the coup attempt just to get a phone call from Washington or a public statement from Washington, which it, would have said, we back you. A public statement would have, would have meant quite a lot more rather than saying, we advise come to both sides. We're trying to figure out what is happening. That, that really was, uh, Gulen, I mean, yes, Turkey wishes Gulen extradited the Americans say, and I have no way of knowing. The Americans say, look, you have not really provided the kind of evidence that would be valid in a court of law in this country. But they also are not harassing the Gulen people, although there had been on different occasions in the past 10 to 15 years, FBI investigations reporting on the illicit things that these guys have done, especially violating US labor laws. I mean, if the American government really wanted to harass them, it could have harassed them and then tell Turkey, look, we're investigating. It hasn't done that either. So that's that's a bone of contention, undoubtedly. But my own my own view is that that night, Turkey's allies actually failed the test, yeah. failed the test of solidarity. That's well, my view. Well, President, for, for the Turkish government, that was OK. We cannot count on them. We cannot rely on them. Okay, do they really trust the Russians? I doubt it, but uh, they moved in that direction. And by the way, because the United States foreign policy in towards the region seemed to be in disarray, uh, and then they thought everything was up for grabs, they also used that uh, uh, lot, if you will, that the Americans left behind, the uncertainty, the imprecision, the lack of strategy and all that, uh, to play the Russians against the United States and vice versa. And so far, they managed to open for themselves, for Turkey, room for maneuver. And I think what's not going to happen now is the ability to do so under the Biden administration. Where, so if I mean, President Putin, of course, did call that night, did provide support course, for President yes. first. So, you know, it, and I know we aren't supposed to deal in counterfactuals as academics, but do you believe that if the White House had given that public statement in July, then the Putin Erdogan meeting does not necessarily take place in August with what appears to have been the bargain, the grand bargain over Syria. I really couldn't say, uh, but uh, certainly the, I mean, given the fact that for probably an overwhelming majority of Turks, the United States was behind the coup attempt, given our history, that phone call would have at least dis uh, dissuaded people from thinking, some people at least from thinking that way. That at the, at the moment of crisis, when it counted, Turkey's allies, notably the United States, beyond the ambassador who was probably working the telephones, as he said to us in a, in a meeting we had with him, were actually standing by the legitimate government of Turkey. Whether we like that government or not, that's not that's immaterial to the discussion. So, so perhaps he would not have gone to Moscow, or if he went, if he still went to Moscow he would not have maybe come up with the, um, what later uh, transpired with the S-400s, more intimate relations and stuff. So where we are now is in 2021. We know that there's been effectively a partition of Syria with Russian and Turkish spheres of influence. We know that the S-400 deal has been made. Where do the two sides start, if they start? Do they start with a specific issue like the S-400s? Do they start with a specific start, yeah. That's where they start. Because, because look, there is, there's Katsa sanctions that will become operational, I think, at the end of this month. The US Congress is wild <laughs> about Turkey. I mean, Turkey virtually has not a single friend left in the US Congress any longer. And there will be pressure on, um, on, the, on the Biden administration. But, I mean, even Anthony Blinken, he, during his uh, testimony to Congress, when asked, he, he said that Turkey was an ally and a so-called strategic partner. I mean, this, 
the, the, the term strategic partner is sacrosanct here. That is how you prove to the country itself that you're very important for the United States. So to say that it was a so-called strategic partnership must have been really a, a blow, a blow to, to, to the uh, government, uh, to the government here. So they'll have to start with the S-400s. And I expect, hopefully, if they started speaking with one another, that before the NATO uh, defense ministers summit in February, some kind of a framework for resolving this will be found. And I think the NATO secretary general is going to be pretty active in trying to find a formula the Congress's wish is that the S-400s leave Turkey's territory. That would be a very difficult thing to do. Then the alternative would be to make sure that Turkey does not operationalize the missiles, in fact, puts them back in their boxes, and a verification mechanism is established whereby NATO also verifies periodically that the S-400s are very well stocked in their boxes and they're not being used. And in return, but, perhaps Turkey also will get a few batteries of uh, the Patriots and then deploy those as well. But the Biden administration has to sell that to Congress, though, of course, because the Biden it's congressional it, uh, Trump, for reasons that I'm not quite clear about, has actually done the Biden administration a favor. I mean, given the fact that they are, they've tried to obstruct them in every single possible way they can before they assume power by implementing the or by announcing the Katsa uh, measures before they left power, they at least took that out of the way for the Biden administration. So the Biden administration did not come up with the five sanctions, but it was the previous administration. So they didn't have to start on the wrong footing with Turkey by taking, having taken a decision that the Turks obviously do not like at all. But if the Biden administration was to say to the Turkish officials, look, we can't do anything about the congressional sanctions. We can't do anything about this. It's out of our hands. Does that completely stop any type of rapprochement between Ankara and Washington? Yes, because uh, Lincoln, I think, also said that um, if things didn't go in the right direction, there, were, there are obviously seven more sanctions that can be implemented against Turkey. So. It, it, both sides are going to try to play hardball. My sense is hopefully, or I mean, if it is my sense, it can't be hopefully. Hopefully they will find a, a formula. Uh, and by the NATO meeting in February, they can actually put the fine uh, measures on it and then they can come up with it. My sense is the Biden administration, if it receives from Turkey the requisite concessions, should be able to persuade Congress that this is a manageable deal. Now, unfortunately, that was the deal, to the best of my knowledge, the Turkish government made with Senator Lindsey Graham. That is, you know, we will not operationalize them. Then we tested them. I don't know why they tested them. And you may want to do a lot of things in life. One of the things you really shouldn't want to do in life is to be on the crosshair of uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, who I think <laughs> is a pretty vindictive person. And he made clear that he felt betrayed. Uh, I mean, his co-authored piece editorial in the Wall Street Journal is pretty venomous as far as, far as I'm concerned. Uh, and so he'll fight this perhaps, but I believe the new administration, especially if Turkey takes steps to disengage from Russia, and it seems evident when the Biden administration takes a much stronger position vis-a-vis -vis Russia, Turkey joins the allies, uh, then we, the Biden administration can tell Congress, hey, Turkey is important. They are doing the right things. Uh, we are cooperating. So let us not insist on the S-400s leaving the territory of Turkey, uh, but we'll make sure that there is a verifiable uh, system and the S-400s will not be deployed, used, or taken out of their boxes. If I could move a little bit to another, <laughs> let's say, tricky issue, which would be the, um, the Kurdish authority in Northeast Syria, which is backed up by the US government. It's actually broken. Yeah, right, well, okay. So, well, let me game this through with you, because of course, from the Turkish government's eyes, the dominant element here is 
the PYD with the YPG militia, again, affiliated for Ankara with the PKK Turkish insurgency. Yeah. On the other hand, I noticed the Biden administration has already brought back in Brett McGurk, who was the it's American envoy in Ankara, yes. Exactly, and that's my question here. I appear to have on the surface <laughs> two sides that are quite distant here from the signals. Is there any type of possible room in the middle where, for example, the Americans said, look, we're going to try to bring in other Kurdish groups, Syrian Kurdish groups under the umbrella to try to eclipse or minimize the PYD, that Turkey can accept that Kurdish area which has US backing? To my understanding, the United States insisted for years now to make Turkey treat the PKK and PYD as two separate entities, and they're not. But it is also true that uh, Turkey is very present in the north of Iraq. It has bases there. It has thousands of troops there. And now with the drones is really waging a pretty, what I, from what I hear, a pretty effective uh, counterinsurgency fight against the PKK. And nobody, not in Europe, not in the United States, actually says a word against that for what Turkey is doing in Iraq. So can they sell the, to the and, and I also understand that, um, at least by his own declaration, the Kurdish, Syrian Kurdish leader, Muslim Kobani, says that they have kicked out most of the PKK fighters, probably Syrian PKK fighters who were in Syria. They sent them back to, 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 to Iraq and that the PYD is now more of an autonomous or independent entity than uh, was the case before. Whether that's true or not, I, I don't know. I don't study this closely. It will, will, is this something that the Turkish side would be willing to accept? I don't know. So far, I don't see any signs that this would be an acceptable way of getting to a deal. But McGurk, of course, is bad news for the Turkish authorities. Will they not see him? Can they not not see him? Not seeing him also allows him to do whatever he wants to do in the Northeast of Syria and the territories where the United States is present without having to bother to ask the Turks whether or not this is something acceptable. So this is going to be, this is going to be pretty tricky in my, in my judgment. And uh, it, the both sides will have to be pretty imaginative, but effectively, with the spring of peace operation, again, the contiguity, ge geographical contiguity of the Kurdish area controlled by the PYG was already broken. That the uh, Syrian government forces are now back and at, at, the, at the borders. So it would be very difficult to put Humpty Dumpty back to where it was in, for, as far as the Kurds are concerned. So, the circumstances before last before October 2019 and circumstances today and in October 2019 McGurk resigned from his job because he was not happy with what President Trump had done but the circumstances now are very different because the Kurds do not really control all the area that they used to control either so maybe that may be used to find a modus vivendi yeah, so some type of contained Kurdish area, if we can Maybe. use that word contained. Maybe. Yeah. But, I mean, I don't think Turkey would officially accept any political identification for, for them. Uh, but uh, maybe, you know, you don't have to declare everything. Maybe, as I said, a modus vivendi uh, would be, could be found. But for that, of course, it will be necessary that the non grata status of Matkir changed and that he could actually come and communicate with his counterparts and with authorities in Turkey. I wonder if we could possibly uh, take one more shift here to the area of economics. I was talking to, um, to Dr. Emery Erson recently, and we were evaluating the Turkish-Russian relationship. And he said, well, look, the limitation on the Turkish-Russian relationship, and indeed, in his eyes, the Turkish-Chinese relationship is, is that Turkey is still tied into an economic system in which you have the prevalence of Western institutions, especially Western financial institutions. And we have this question that we haven't quite broached yet, which is Turkey's relations, for example, with the EU. To what extent is Turkey's economic position mean that no matter how much flexibility they want vis-a-vis -vis Russia, even vis-a-vis -vis China, 
given these issues that we talked about, they really have to keep looking west because of, you know, the, as it were, the primacy at this point of those economic relationships with Europe and to an extent with the U.S. I'll answer your question, but just for the benefit of the viewers, there will be another issue that will be poison, that is potentially poisonous for Turkish-American relations. And that is the Halkbank court case is going to start on the 3rd of March. And we now know, thanks to the reporting by the New York Times, that Trump administration, the Trump Justice Department, have effectively managed to get this process postponed, try to block things, try to get this out of the agenda. The Biden administration, we can be sure are not going, is not going to do that. So that trial is going to go on. And for uh, whatever reasons we understand from uh, the um, pleas on the side of the Turkish government by the Trump administration that it, is, it was important that this uh, trial actually not take place. So if it does take place and if on, on um, savory things come about, this will also be a, an issue that will uh, create problems between the Biden administration and, and the Turkish government. As to your question, Emre Ershan, who's a young uh, and academic person that I respect a lot, is right in that there is a limit to what Russia can do for Turkey economically. It served Russia's purposes to actually sow the seeds of discord in within NATO and the Atlantic Alliance by selling S-400s to Turkey, building the nuclear power plant, uh, having very intimate relations, which then made Turkey suspect in the corridors of NATO as to well, we're going to be discussing things about right? all of that. Anyway, not that Hungary should be differently treated as far as I'm concerned, but Russia cannot carry Turkey economically. Russia can barely carry itself economically, despite all the gas and oil. So yes, Turkey will have to deal with the West. Uh, it needs to get resources from the West. And with the European Union, much, much to my chagrin, there is a modus vivendi now. For the last two years, the, uh, none of the statements by the EU, the European Council, or by European authorities mentioned Turkey as an accession country. In the last uh, meeting between the Turkish foreign minister and the foreign minister of, uh, of the EU, Mr. Borrell, he talked about Turkey as a neighboring country with which the EU would like to have good relations. And given the fact that despite all the late buruhaha about Turkey's destination being in Europe that's being uttered, there is really not much interest on the part of those in power in Turkey to actually do what is necessary to that end. The two sides are happy to have relations without necessarily talking about membership. And that is the modus vivendi that I think the Germans preferred all along. And that is the way the, uh, that is the, way the uh, relations are going to be operated on. Two days ago, the European Union declared that they were not going to pursue sanctions, although earlier in December, they said they were going to wait for the Biden administration's decisions in order to decide themselves in March whether or not they would sanction Turkey. Things may change again, but it's obvious the uh, relation is not going to be built on expediency. Turkey is a big market. Turkey holds three and a half million <laughs> refugees, which the European Union would not like to see cross the border. And uh, Turkey needs the uh, legitimation of uh, European Union relations economically. With the rise in interest rates, money is flowing and the dollar is losing value domestically. So this is, this is going to be, so there is a, an equilibrium, which I dislike intensely, but there is an equilibrium now in relations. And if uh, the Turkish government manages to have some kind of an agreement with the Biden administration, so the tensions are lowered, then um, that'll be it. Turkey will be in NATO. It will no longer be called a strategic partner. It will no longer be called an accession country, uh, but its presence in NATO will continue. And, and Turkey does do a lot of things in NATO, by the way. And it will continue to have economic relations with the European Union. Just to be clear, for my understanding is, is that your preferred path, if it were possible, would be to return to closer Turkish 
EU relations, including that possible path to accession? Yeah, because that comes with a number of conditions, and those conditions pertain to Turkish Turkey's domestic order, rule of law, principles of democracy, better administration, accountability, transparency, and all the, the so-called Copenhagen criteria. Mm. Uh, and a, a relation of expediency means nobody, I mean, their declarations don't mention uh, any of those things any longer. And Borrell cheated when he spoke with his counterpart in front of the media he didn't say a word about, Tur he talked about Turkey's conditions. And then in the written version, they opened the parentheses and added human rights rule of law. That's disgraceful. That really is disgraceful. This is a very undignified behavior. If you don't wanna say it, don't say it, but don't try to cheat by putting it in the written document. So as you can imagine, I'm a bit uh, disenchanted to put it mildly with their behavior, but uh, and in, in a way, prior to 2001, 2002, these relations were defined, in my view, by hypocrisy, double talk, and insincerity. So for a few years, we went beyond that, and I got very hopeful. Uh, now I'm more experienced and more, uh, how shall I say, blasé, if you will, on it. And uh, we go back to insincerity, double talk, and hypocrisy. Actually, what I just described, if that is what's going to happen, we're being more honest, you know, like we're not interested in membership or we're not interested in your membership either. Isn't that nice? So how can we go on having a workable arrangement? Let's say this time next year, look forward. And from what you're reading in terms of Turkey's position vis-a-vis -vis the US, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, vis-a-vis -vis Europe, do you think we are still in a state of, I'm not sure we quite call it limbo, but an uncertain balancing that takes place here? Or do you actually see some type of tilt in Turkey's position that's going to take place in this changing world order uh, it towards is, Moscow or away from Moscow? It is quite obvious to me for the moment anyway, given what the Turkish government has been trying to do in the last two months, trying to patch things up with the European Union, trying to make good with the United States, trying to open relations with Israel. There are now news about how Hamas operatives who were doing lots of things here, obviously under the supervision. I mean, uh, not encouraged by the government, but certainly the government must know what the Hamas operatives do here. They are not being restricted. They're not being given visas and some of their activities have been curtailed and stuff. Turkey is in a charm offensive in order to actually finish off its own self-imposed isolation. You cannot have no representation, diplomatic relations with all of Syria, Egypt, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and uh, nowadays United Arab Emirates. Now, I am not one of those who believe that we should start talking to, to Bashar al-Assad, but uh, obviously on Israel and, and on Egypt, Turkey lost a lot of ground, and those countries have uh, made their relations with uh, Tur Turkey's two rivals, the Republic of Cyprus and uh, Greece, uh, much more intimate. And that was all Turkey's own choices. And we have now a Qatar-Saudi agreement, the full, ex the full text of which I don't know. I, don't, I think it hasn't been made public. And I, we don't know what it entails because the original, one of the original demands of Saudi Arabia was that Turkey, the Turkish base be closed. I don't think the Qataris would accept this, but obviously they're taking their distance from Muslim Brotherhood and Turkey will be under pressure to take its distance from Muslim Brotherhood. My sense is Turkey will try to main, will try to maintain its strategic Western orientation, but it will negotiate to have as much autonomy as possible in the Western strategic framework. That's how so, I see things evolving. And so this, exactly. this might require under the Biden administration taking more distance from Russia. And how Putin will respond, that's a big question. I don't know. I don't know what Emre said about that. So take this all the way around with a skillful Biden administration approach, a big if, but with a skillful Biden administration approach, there are possibilities here um, oh, yeah. in terms yeah. of, yeah. yeah. It depends also on, uh, you know, the thing is, you, you, there's always the risk of overplaying your hand. I hope Turkey doesn't, but I would think the Biden administration will want to make, if to the extent that they want to repair relations with the European Union, 
make NATO more functional. Turkey will be a country that would be helpful in all of those things, but that means they will also be asking Turkey to be more cooperative with the allies, to not insult other countries, heads of states or government, and be more of a team player. And Turkey will in turn have its own, have its own demands. And to the extent that the Bidenites will take their democracy promotion seriously, and I think they will have to in order to differentiate themselves both from Trump and from China, then there will be pressures on Turkey to actually get its own house democratically in order. Think about it, if there is indeed a summit of the demo- of democracies and Turkey is not invited, it would not go down well. I don't think Turkey would want to be excluded from that summit, but it would not want to do everything that is required to be invited to that summit either. So somewhere in between, I think a modus operandi will be found. And your emphasis on good management or good, yeah, good management of those relations uh, is really, really key for both sides. Well, from our jaded perspective, let us hope for that in the near future. Yeah. <laughs> let me uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I thank you Sullivan. for inviting me. Thank you okay. for this. And let me thank the viewers of World Unfiltered for joining us. Uh, remember that you can give us feedback and comments on this through the Deep Dive Politics YouTube uh, channel where we're hosted. And of course, follow Deep Dive Politics on Twitter for all the latest commentary, the latest analysis. We'll be coming at you soon. Uh, following this interview with a follow-up with uh, uh, about, US, about Turkish-Israeli relations, which picks up some, some of the issues we've talked about. But for now, stay safe, stay sane, be decent to each other. I'm Scott Lucas. This has been World Unfiltered. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.